Yeah, we are live. You can proceed. Can we start now? Yes, yes, yes you can proceed. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Tejas, uh, would you like to do a presentation or just? Dr. Ben Killer. From USA and Dr. Guido Ferro from Colombia. Uh, here we have Dr. Nagra Shetty. Dr. Anil Sood, Dr. Teer Fiyas, and Dr. Abhishek Das from India. Over to you, Dr. Guido Ferro. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tejas, for, for inviting me here to be with you. Let me share my, my screen. Okay. Again, thanks, thanks to uh, all the team for Auto TV, Chanel. Uh, thanks uh, to you, Dr. Tejas, for invite me here today uh, to, to share uh, our knowledge with Dr. Kivle and Dr. Sasia that uh, all of you knows uh, Dr. Ben Kivle and Dr. Aaron Sasia. They are a well and well recognized uh, shoulder surgeon. And in, in and the vast majority of, of uh, the work is about the scapula and the scapula movement. And it's an honor for me to be, be part of this uh, meeting. I would like to, to talk about the anatomy of the scapula first, and then Dr. Hibley will give us a talk about the scapular biomechanical and examination. And after that, with Dr. Sasia, we are going to discuss some uh, cases, okay? I'm Guido Fierro. I'm, I'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon. I work at Fundacion Santa Fe de Bogota here in Bogota, Colombia, and at University of Andes University. Okay, my, my, oh, my, my, uh, objective of uh, this morning in the next 12 minutes is to try to understand the anatomy of the scapula. I, I won't show you just picture and, and data about the muscle and vector. No, no, I really uh, would like to you to understand the anatomy because if you understand your anatomy, then you can understand the physical examination and the problem of your patient. Look, this is the, the, the our daily life in the clinic. We can find a patient with scapula uh, alteration of the scapula movement or pain. But the first question that in my opinion you, you should do is, okay, where's the problem? I mean, at the beginning you say, okay, where's the, the problem? And uh, that question of where means the anatomy, okay? What part of the shoulder uh, is having a problem? And then you can find where is the problem, okay? And then the muscle, the muscle is the key around the scapula because remember the scapula is almost floating in the posterior part of the, of the shed, of the shoulder and the muscles provide the movement and provide all the, those function around the, the scapula. Where muscle, the periscapular muscle, the muscles, you can divide the muscle in the shoulder in axis to the scapula, scapula to the humerus and from the axis to the humerus. Today, we are going to talk about the axis to the scapula muscles. And remember, the scapulothoracic joint is like a, is a central axis of the upper extremity. It's like a back hole. If you have a problem in the proximal part of the back hole, then you will have some problems in the rest of the upper, of the upper extremity. The, the, in, in the engine of that back hole means all the, the I mean, means the, that the, your, your back hole is in a, in a well function. Okay, let me see, I have some problem here. Okay, and with the scapulothoracic joint, the same thing. I mean, the engine of that back hole in the scapulothoracic uh, joint, all those vectors need to work well with long length and no thickness in order to provide a good movement of the, of the scapula. The, you, the scapula has many movement, many, many movement, but in, if you don't think about the movement, you think about the views that the, uh, that the physician view for your patient, you can find a superior view, a posterior view of the scapula or a lateral view of the scapula with internal and rotation uh, movement, upward and downward rotation and anterior and posterior tilt of the scapula. 
and the, of course a combination of those movement. And from the med school, med school, we learn that the, in the coronal plane, remember in the posterior view, we can find a superficial layer or a deep layer, trapezius and levator scapulae and rhomboid uh, muscle. Okay, in the in the superficial layer, we find the trapezius. Trapezius come from the come from the nuchal ligament until T12 and go to insert in the the spine of the scapula in the most lateral part of the spine of the scapula and clavicle across the spine of the scapula and in the base of the spine of the of the scapula and in, you think in the in a not in just muscle you think in three muscle then you can understand why the trapezius have many many um, function in the shoulder trapezius help us to retraction elevation and posterior tilting based upon that the recruitment pattern of those different vector of the scapula. Remember, this is not just one plane movement. I mean, this is academic view, it's a posterior view, but in the real life, we, we have other direction of the movement because the position of the scapula a little bit in the posterior part of the, of the spine. What, what is the innervation of the trapezius? The spinal accessory nerve. Remember, the spinal accessory nerve have to, uh, Two branches, is cranial root and spinal root. The spinal roots come from the cervical uh, nerve and the cranial roots come from the uh, medulla oblonga. They go upward in the foramen magnus and then going downward in the jugular foramen. Uh, and the, the branch that go outside the, the cranium is the external branch. Go outside from the jugular foramen and then go, go downward in the posterior uh, part of the posterior triangular triangular neck, uh, provide innervation to the uh, sternocleidomastoidal muscle, and then provide the innervation to the trapezius. Look the relation between the cervical nerve and C2, C3, and C4 with the uh, spinal accessory nerve. It just not it just not the, the external branch. The external branch receive and and link and join with the C2, C3, and C4 in many dissections. Then we're talking about the deep layer. In the deep layer, we find the levator scapulae muscle. Remember, this levator scapulae muscle is not insert in the most uh, superior part of the medial border of the scapula, insert in the medial border, but distal to the tip of the scapula. And the function of this muscle is elevate scapula medially and rotate scapula tilting glenoid cavity inferiorly, like this. Remember, look the vector of that muscle and then you can understand the movement of the scapula. Then the rhomboid, the rhomboid come from C7 to T1 and inserting the base of the spine of the scapula. And the function of this uh, muscle is the rhomboid minor and rhomboid major is retract, elevate and rotate the scapula, but they fix the scapula to thoracic wall. This is the rhomboid minor and the rhomboid major as a similar function, function of the rhomboid minor, but distal to the spine of the scapula. The innervation is provided for, for by dorsal scapular nerve. Look, when you think in the dorsal scapular nerve, I mean, at the beginning, you say, okay, C5, that is the thing that we remember, but look the distance between the medial border of the scapula to the nerve is 1.5 centimeters, it's 1 to 3.2 centimeters, in a, in, in, but, but in average is 1.5 centimeters, the nerve going posterior to the posterior serratus, and this nerve comes from the anterior to posterior in the shoulder, from a uh, piercing the middle scalene muscle. Okay, look, the first root this uh, nerve is C5 in the 70% of the cases. The piercing middle scalene muscle in the 74% of the cases. And the patient is something with the, with the microphone open. And, and in the half of the cases, this nerve provides innovation for scapula and rhomboid muscle. Uh, is something with the microphone open? Okay. At this moment, we, we have seen the coronal plane, like a posterior view, okay? 
And in this posterior view, you can find like a trapezius like this, elevator scapula and rhomboid like this. And you are thinking right now in this muscle, but look in this vector here, elevator scapula, rhomboid minor and rhomboid major. And if you try to fix the scapula in some point, maybe you can think, okay, we, we can, we can perform an example like a balance in the scapula, but this, this is not a, a, a perfect example. This is not awkward because for me, it's like a, a bubble level. The scapula is like a bubble level. You need to provide stabilization, a good movement in all those uh, vector and plane in order to put the bubble in the middle of the bubble level. Because if you think in just one plane, probably you will not understand all the movement of the scapula because the, all the muscle around the scapula works together. In the other plane, remember, we just see the posterior view. Now we are going to talk about the axial uh, view. In this uh, view, we find the serratus anterior muscle. This, this is a big muscle in the shoulder, important muscle in the shoulder because provide all those uh, function, protraction, upward rotation, abduction, posterior tilting, and internal rotation of the scapula. According to what? According to the fi fiber that he recruits in the movement. Remember, the serratus anterior muscles come from ribs one to nine and insert in anterior part in the medial border of the scapula. But this, this is just not one muscle and tendon. Real is like a three uh, muscle, the upper part, the middle part, and the lower part of the serratus anteriors, uh, anterior. And the upper part help to, yes, to protract a little the, the scapula, but, but let the scapula rotate the middle part of the serratus help in the protraction of the scapula and the lower part of the serratus uh, help the scapula to going upward. Look, this is like a really big and, and a fun shaped muscle uh, with, with different insertion in the scapula and all those insertions like a trapezius. Trapezius has a big muscle with different insertion. The serratus is a big muscle with a different... Uh, <laughs> The microphone open. Okay, thank you. And if you think in the most superior part of the serratus, then you can understand the function of the provide like a stable, a stable uh, point in order to provide a movement working, of course, with the trapezius. Look, the inferior part of the of the anterior serratus insert almost touching the rhomboid major fibers in the most inferior part of the scapula. The innervation is provided for the long thoracic nerve. Remember C5, C7, C6. Then uh, those nerves join the C7 and create the long thoracic, thoracic nerve. And this nerve pierces the scalenus medial muscle and then going in the lateral part of, part of the chest to provide a innervation to the serratus anterior. The three critical point of this nerve is this point. Penetration into the substance of the scalenus medial muscle in a tight facial band of tissue arising from the inferior aspect of the brachial plexus and the angulation over the second ribs. If you take into account these three points, maybe you can find some like a, the, the points where the nerve could have some problems. Then. Uh, this Monday, when you're in your clinic and you see a patient with this uh, scapula, then you can you can think, okay, the problem is that the scapula is not against to the uh, thoracic wall. Then the muscle that work that, that provide this uh, this position is the serratus anterior. Now I know why this patient has a problem in the serratus anterior muscle. And in the sagittal view, remember the lateral view that we were talking is the pectoralis minor. When you think about your mechanic of the shoulder, pec minor uh, play a role, but it's not like a big muscle in playing a role. But when when you have a tightness in the pectoralis minor, you have you can have a protraction of the scapula, anterior tilted scapula uh, positioning that that make you have some problems when the with the movement. And I'm pretty sure Dr. Kibler will will teach us about that in the next presentation. Okay, remember the anatomy is like our geography. We really need to know the anatomy to understand the anatomy in order to find the city that we want, we want to go. Thank you very much. Uh,
believe me, thank you very much for this kind invitation, Dr. Tejas. And I'm so looking forward for the talks for Dr. Kibler and Dr. Sasia talks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for excellent talk and presentation. Uh, Dr. Nagras sir and Nisit sir are with us. Uh, so we are uh, moving to presentation and then we will discuss. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Tejas, for putting this together, and Dr. Fierro for organizing this. I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Um, we want to talk about the role of the scapula today. Dr. Fierro said a great example of the muscles anatomy. Now let's talk about how they function and then what happens when there's a dysfunction. Then we want to talk about evaluation and treatment. I am at the Lexington Clinic in Lexington, Kentucky, USA. This presentation will look at the mechanics and the pathomechanics of the scapula and determine exactly what we mean by scapular dyskinesis. We will then use this as the basis for how to examine the scapula and then talk about cases because this is how you actually see the patients in your office. This is a very important uh, picture of the biomechanics of the scapula. Uh, this doesn't have the, mu the muscles involved, but it talks about why all these uh, structures are important. Remember that the anterior connection is the clavicle to the SC joint. That's the only bony connection. But remember that it's a very important guide for the motion. And remember that the, that the clavicle is an S-shaped curved structure that attaches between the scapula and the axial skeleton. As Dr. Fierro showed very nicely, posteriorly, it's all muscles, all dynamic. This is very, very important, guided by the bony connection. This allows a triangular base so that the arm can function to do all the things in space that that crane model was showing. The AC joint also happens to be a very important structure here because it's a stable pivot to allow these two bones to articulate. So let's look at the mechanics. Let's look at the two-dimensional and three-dimensional, as was mentioned, uh, motion. There's been some very good work that's shown that indeed you have a two-dimensional motion of the scapula that is arranged by force couples, straightest anterior, lower trapezius, middle trapezius, upper, tra upper trapezius are the main muscles that are doing this. And you notice that with the arm down at the side, the axis of rotation of the scapula is toward the medial border of the scapula. However, as the arm goes into the overhead position, the axis of rotation moves out to the AC joint. That's why AC joint stability is so important to maximize, optimize the ability to move the arm in scapulohumeral rhythm. However, this is three-dimensional. Now, this is a, a video taken from our lab showing the three axes of the motion. And we can look at this and see each of these arrows represents one of the axes of motion. The red is the upward downward rotation. The green is anterior posterior tilt. And the blue is internal and external rotation. So if you watch this video, you can see this. Watch one of these. Look at the red and it goes up. This is motion of the scapula with arm motion. Look at the green. It tilts posteriorly. And if you look at the blue, it starts into internal rotation, then goes into external rotation. And the result is for the glenoid to be elevated and the chromium to be moved out of the way of the moving arm. That's the normal mechanics of the scapula with arm motion in, in scapular humeral rhythm. Well, let's talk about what dyskinesis is. Well, kinesis means normal motion, either resting position or dynamic motion. It's best when it works into this retraction position as was shown. Now, dyskinesis is alteration of that motion. <clears throat> and basically it can be observed as alteration of the position or the motion. Remember, this is not an injury. 
it doesn't automatically mean that there's an injury. It just means that there's an impairment of this ability of scapular humeral rhythm. It's part of the injury process and you have to evaluate it. It happens very, very commonly in association with all shoulder injuries. So this video shows, this is a American baseball player and you can, I think you can tell which shoulder is the damaged shoulder. It's the right shoulder there. So we have a good of, about ability to look at kinesis and dyskinesis. As you watch the medial border, you see the obvious, obviously prominence of the inferior medial border showing straightness is not working well. Now, if you elevate the arm, you see that especially in, in uh, uh, re descent, how the altered position occurs. This is basically a combination of what we call protraction. So now what causes that thing that we can see? Well, as mentioned, you can have problems with the nerves. That's a relatively uncommon problem though in scapodiskinesis. You can have problems with the joint. You can have AC joint problems, arthritis, AC separations, or iatrogenic where there's been too much distal clavicle removed in a distal clavicle excision. You can also have uh, clinical humeral joint problems, labral injuries, biceps problems, instabilities, arthritis. We'll show you examples of that as well. Certainly bone causes, if you, if you alter the strut, fractures of the clavicle that are in malunion or nonunion can alter the scapular uh, motion. And then more commonly, it's a soft tissue problem. And so much of the joint, so, so, so much of the scapula is involved by uh, muscle activation, then muscle inhibition or alteration of motion uh, can affect the scapula motion and is the major reason for dyskinesis. This is the universe of all the problems that can cause scapular dyskinesis. Remember, this is scapular dyskinesis is a motion alteration. And it's caused by something. In the non-operative situations, you can have, as mentioned, the pectoralis minor being tied to certainly protracts the scapula. If you have altered rotation of the glenohumeral humeral joint as a result of throwing or overhead activities, that can create a wind up where the scapula is protracted. Certainly latissimus dorsi um, tightness by acting on the humerus can pull the shoulder forward. Serratus anterior weakness, as was mentioned, this is a very, very common problem. Don't forget that maximal activation of the periscapular muscles is off of stabilized core. So 50% of the time in patients with dyskinesis, you can find out abnormalities of core strength or stability. Lower trapezius is very, very commonly a problem. Upper trapezius being tight, lower trapezius being weak. Now, in the op there are operative things. Sometimes pectoralis minor is so tight you cannot loosen up, so it has to be released. Fracture clavicle or AC joint injury can damage the strut. Glenohumeral humeral joint injury, you can see a lot of times in baseball players or perhaps even cricket, I don't know enough about cricket to know, but internal derangements in the shoulder itself can create muscle weakness, which creates the scapodiskinesis. This thing called uh, snapping scapula, so there's a post-traumatic muscle detachment of the rhomboids and low trap that can create this problem. And then any type of nerve injuries, whether it be the peripheral nerves or uh, central nerves. So this is the entire universe of problems that you have to check for when you're evaluating the scapula. Now, the way scapular dyskinesis affects shoulder function are in four ways. The first is that it's an impairment. It has the, dis the potential to affect the problem of the scapular rolls and scapular humor rhythm if you do this off enough. If you don't have any use of your arm overhead, then dyskinesis is not going to be much of a problem. Dyskinetic shoulders um, before injury find that there's a 43% 43 increased, 43 increased risk of, sub of subsequent injury if you have scapular dyskinesis in a pre-season physical exam. So you modify the injury risk by treating the scapula. Second is the most common is that it's associated with symptomatic shoulders. 67 to 100% of patients with, with scapular dyskinesis with shoulder problems have scapular dyskinesis as part of the clinical findings. Whether it's a cause or an effect, we don't know for sure, but you have to treat it, you have to evaluate it and treat it. We'll show you many, many examples of this. And while almost every diagnosis that you can come up in the shoulder has been associated uh, with scapular dyskinesis. So uh, if you have not seen scapular dyskinesis 
when you have been evaluating shoulders with injury, the dyskinesis has probably seen you. So remember to look for it. Another way that dyskinesis affects shoulder pathology is that sometimes it'll give you a good idea how to treat this, especially when you're talking about bone injuries, fractured clavicles, AC joint problems. If you see dyskinesis and that shows you that indeed the scapula dysfunction is part of the problem and you need to therefore treat, it gives you a better idea about when to treat fractures. Finally, indeed, if you have loss of muscle function, either because of the neurological problems or because of this post-traumatic scapular, dis, uh, scapular detachment, that tells you that you need to treat this. So let's look at these. Let's look at dyskinesis and shoulder pathology. Let's talk about rotator cuff disease. Here's a patient with a six month history of gradual onset of pain. He has the classical rotator cuff clinical findings and he has the MRI that shows you a tear of the rotator cuff. Why would you treat the scapula when the patient has a, disc, uh, has a rotator cuff tear? Because non-operative rehabilitation has been shown if you correct the scapular issues in the chronic rotator cuff population to alter the need for surgery. You decrease the functional problems, decrease the symptoms, and therefore you can get by without having to do surgery. And this has been shown to be stable over two years. This is a study from a large group of patients in rotator cuff disease in the United States, where it shows that if you look at the people who do not need surgery, you find that if you do physical therapy, you can, you can reach a level where 80% of the people with chronic rotator cuff tears do not need surgery because they have improved their scapular function, improved their symptoms, and improved their, their capability of using the arm. Now, that means they got to keep up their exercises, but not everybody who has a rotator cuff tear needs to have surgery. Certainly, when we're talking about impingement, Scapula is a major player in impingement. We know that 3D kinematic analysis shows that impingement patients have decreased ability to posteriorly tilt or get the scapula out of the way. If you correct that problem, a lot of the symptoms of the impingement will go away, so you do not need to do subacromial decompression surgery. As a matter of fact, I don't, I've done, I do about one scapular um, bursectomy, I mean, uh, uh, subacromial decompression per year as the only operation. It's not needed if you correct the dynamics of the scapula. This is a patient, this is a worker who has impingement findings. He has pain in the shoulder, he gets a little bit of injection and they, come, and they say, does, does he need to have a subacromial decompression or rotator cuff surgery? You can see once again, he has pain on the front of the shoulder, right in the classical anterior chromial position. He has a positive painful arc it hurts with forward flexion and rotation. He has a little bit of tightness and stiffness, but this hurts him as he moves his arm. Now, so you say, well, that's his problem. He needs to have a subacromial decompression. He actually has demonstrated forward flexion, weakness, and pain on the front. Well, he's obviously got a rotator cuff tear. Well, let's look at his scapula. And we can notice that he has a slightly asymmetrical position of the scapula compared to the opposite side. But the main thing you find is that he raises his arm, he gets an impingement position. He has now obvious dyskinesis compared to the opposite side as he elevates his arm, showing this protraction of the scapula and winging of the media, uh, problems in the medial border of the scapula. He has upper trap prominence with forward flexion. Once again, you see loss of control of the inferior medial border. This is not a long thoracic nerve problem. This is an alteration of the muscle activation. If you stabilize, if you do these tests called corrective maneuvers, you can actually assist the scapula into position and you relieve all of his symptoms. He has no pain. He has a complete elimination of his symptoms of anterior impingement by, by helping to move the scapula. And then if you stabilize the scapula, you find that his demonstrated rotator cuff strength is gone. He has no pain and no weakness. So once again, showing the role of the scapula in these patients. This is a, uh, another example of a thrower who has posterior shoulder pain, uh, and he has findings that would be associated with uh, injury in the shoulder. If you stabilize his scapula, he has a positive, what's called DLS, which is a pain on the back of the shoulder, which is an indication of an of a internal labral injury. However, if you stabilize the scapula, you find that you eliminate 
his pain, showing that the scapula position of internal impingement is creating some of the symptoms. Therefore, you need to try to rehabilitate this patient before you talk about surgery. Here we're talking about clavicle fractures. Here's this obvious clavicle fracture in an 18-year-old American football player. And the, the, the question is, what do you do? What are the indications for treatment of this? Do you operate on this? Do you treat it conservatively? In the United States, most people would say this is too much shortening and too much angulation to uh, accept uh, without doing some surgery. However, there are people who will say, well, no, this will go ahead and heal because it's not uh, distracted or anything of this nature. Well, the problem is this is a lot of times what you'll end up with. You'll end up with this malunion. It's healed, bones healed. This, this is not a, a non-union. But if you look at him, the reason why, why is he in my office? Because he cannot raise his arm. And the reason he cannot raise his arm is because the scapula is in such a protracted position. If you look at the x-ray, you can see obviously the difference between the two clavicles. And also look at the scapula. Look at the glenohumeral joint. On the left side, the glenoid is facing away. On this side, look, the glenoid is facing you, showing that this is, this is not just an angula angulation. This is an anterior rotation of the entire scapula. And you can see on this 3D CT, obviously, the angulation. But look at this anterior tilt, which is creating this position. If you look at this, here's, here's the fixed position right here. And you have angulation and shortening, but you also have anterior rotation forward, and this is what is creating the scapular protraction, creating the clinical symptoms. As you well know, taking, fixing this surgically, breaking it, realigning it, all this stuff is a much bigger operation than the original surgery to do just a uh, open reduction internal fixation of a early clavicle fracture. So the finding of scapular dyskinesis in this patient may help you decide about whether you operate on these early rather than late, because here is your problem. You have a shortened clavicle. This is all he can raise his arm because he cannot move his acromion and his scapula to uh, allow normal scapular humeral rhythm. This is another example of, 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 of a patient with this to help you with the diagnosis. All right, this is not angulated. This is not shortened. What do you do about this person? Well, here he is in the office. Let's look at him. He this is three weeks, two weeks after the injury. You can see he really doesn't have a lot of pain at the fracture site, but he has this drooping, drooping of the entire shoulder. And if you look at his scapula, well, first of all, if you look at his arm, this is all that he can only elevate up to about 80 degrees because of pain in the acromion, not at the fracture site, but subacromial space. If you look at him posteriorly, you can see the obvious asymmetry and scapular dyskinesis with the protraction of the scapula. Now you can, like you normally reduce any fracture, take the distal end and move it to the proximal end. And what am I doing? I'm moving the scapula and the acromion. Now I can stabilize him in that position and he all of a sudden doesn't have that same pain, indicating that the scapular protraction is some of the main, main reason why he does, does not have better use. Therefore you can make a case See, once again, he cannot raise his arm uh, in the unsupported position of the scapula protracted. Therefore, you can make a case for a surgical pr procedure on this guy. And sure enough, this is three weeks later, we did it with a plate. And you can see the change in the position, position of a scapula. He's not have the dyskinesis. And now he can elevate his arm because now he can move this as a unit. Okay, let's talk about AC joints. Okay, what's going on here? What is the injury? What is the problem here? The scapula goes down. The clavicle does not go up. The scapula goes down. You have a loss of all of the ligamentous structures. And once again, on 3D CT, you can see this is inferior and medial, but also this rotation. That's the problem. So here's a uh, soccer player with this abnormality. And you would say this is a type five or a type three. Well, if you look at him by movement of the scapula, I can reduce that to zero, showing once again that scapular protraction, scapular alteration of movement is the major thing that you see here. And uh, it just, it doesn't work right. Now, this is another individual 
with an AC separator. This is a firefighter. You see the obvious eight and drop off. He's obviously got this injury. But now look at his scapula. His scapula is normal. He still probably has a conoid ligament. So in this situation, this person does not need surgery. He needs rehabilitation, and then he did well with that. The other, uh, the first in the individual would be benefited by surgery to correct the scapular problem. Here's another good case. This is a lady who fell off her horse a year ago, and she has a, an established non-union of the scapula, and she cannot elevate her arm. The reason she cannot elevate her arm is because the motor of her scapula, which is the straightest anterior, is not attached anymore to the rest of, to all where the muscles attach. So she cannot raise her arm. So this requires surgical treatment. Once again, showing how important the entire scapular body is to allow for normal arm motion. Uh, look at this patient with plantar humor arthritis. He had surgery eight months ago for a reverse shoulder replacement. He has a painful weak shoulder. He cannot ele elevate his arm. He was sent in to say, well, I, we may need to revise this total shoulder replacement. Now, what you need to revise is his muscle activation. You have not done good rehabilitation. Just because you fixed the arthritis does not mean you fixed the function as a surgeon. You see, you can only elevate his arm to about 90 degrees and it's painful. Once again, you see this loss of control. Now, my partner can actually take his arm and do this scapular uh, assistance test, just doing, the, doing what the muscles should be doing, and he can raise his arm. So this means there's nothing wrong with his shoulder replacement. This wrong, his serratus anterior and low trap are not working. So you treat those and you treat the patient. Finally, now we're actually getting into a neurologic case. And indeed you see there's a asymmetry right here. Now remember that in this long thoracic nerve palsy, every single muscle in the body is working normally except the serratus anterior. And yet this is the most profound problem. You cannot elevate your arm above 90 degrees. You get this characteristic picture of the, of the uh, scapular dyskinesis inferior medial border prominence, but you cannot elevate the arm, showing the, in, the extreme importance of the serratus anterior in any type of scapular function and arm function. So you have to go ahead and do your transfers for this. And there's the pre-op, there's the post-op, and he works very nicely now because he now has control of the inferior medial border where he did not have it here. So therefore, this is, the, this is how the scapula and its alterations can affect uh, shoulder function in a many, many types of diagnoses. Now, Dr. Shasha is gonna then therefore show how this dyskinesis and alterations in shoulder motion has clinical consequences, the evaluation and treatment. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for excellent presentation. Uh, now we move forward with the last presentation and then uh, we can discuss the cases as well as the scenarios. Over to you, Dr. Sazia. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, the two preceding presentations being as excellent as they were. Uh, Dr. Fierro did a fantastic job laying the foundation of the anatomy, which is actually going to tie in very nicely to what I'm going to present to you. And then, of course, Dr. Kibler gave us uh, really the, the core of what we're talking about. And so what I'm going to, to do for you is I'm going to give you the examination process, but I'm going to use a single case to guide us through this. Um, and this is a case that you're probably going to see more often than even the other ones that Dr. Kibler presented, uh, because this is a non-operative situation with somebody with shoulder pain. So uh, in our world, uh, you know, we think very much in a, in a systematic and, and algorithmic way. And so uh, this algorithm that you see presented to you here uh, is one that Dr. Kibler and I have worked on for, for quite some time. Um, and we've recently published it just about a year, year and a half ago. And so in essence, what happens is, is you begin with your shoulder pain uh, or dysfunction or possibly even both, and you have to figure out why that's there. 
And so we have to determine, is the scapula a key part of this problem or not? And so that is your first assessment, is to perform an evaluation that looks for scapular dyskinesis. And the nice part is, if, that, if it is not present, then we're going to assume the scapula is probably not a major contributor. So we have to look at other areas uh, uh, that, or other contributors, if you will, that would be part of the problem. However, if we do see scapular dyskinesis, we want to verify that what I think I'm seeing that, that doesn't look correct actually is not correct. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to perform three different corrective maneuvers to see if we can alter motion and alter strength and alter muscle activation either in a positive way or is it unaffected? Because if we can make things better with our corrective maneuvers, then we have verified that the scapula is part of the problem. However, if the corrective maneuvers don't change anything, now we have to think that maybe this, again, may not be necessarily a scapular uh, related cause. And so uh, in essence, the way that whole exam works is like this. We actually begin looking very simply like most individuals do with our, with our eyes. We use our eyes. We use a, a postural assessment, um, looking at individuals both from the side as well as posteriorly and anteriorly. Um, we do our scapular dyskinesis test, which you've seen demonstrated in a number of videos so far. Uh, the key areas of palpation include structures on the anterior aspect of the shoulder. So uh, primarily we're looking at the coracoid attachment areas. Uh, you can also uh, palpate other structures anteriorly, but primarily we're looking for uh, the pectoralis minor and short head of the biceps attachment in particular. Uh, of course, the integrity of the AC joint, as Dr. Kibler explained, as well as the medial border of the scapula, because that's a prime area of tenderness, but can also be an area of muscle detachment. So we have to make sure we're, we are not contending with something very traumatic. Uh, the corrective maneuvers, as I mentioned, We'll also perform scapular muscle testing, manual muscle testing, if you will. And then finally, we will look at the kinetic chain as a unit, looking at the integrity of the legs and the trunk as, as how the, uh, that interacts with the arm. And so I'm going to uh, bring all of these individual pieces uh, together in a case. So here's our case presentation. Uh, so we have a 22-year-old runner. Um, she complains of right shoulder pain during her arm swing when she's uh, going through her strides. And she also has scapular soreness after her activity. So you can see on the right side, the right side is a little more dysfunctional than the left. And, and when we actually get down to it uh, in this image, you can see there are some distinct differences. So what do we actually see? Well, the first thing that, that brings to my attention is the position of the medial border of both uh, the scapulas. So on the left side, which is the unaffected arm, we have more of a vertical position, whereas on the affected arm, we have a more of an angulated position. We also, on the left side, we see a very pronounced tendon of the inferior portion of the serratus anterior. So already my brain is starting to think, this is probably very much muscle related, but I don't know just yet if this is a strength problem, is this a flexibility problem, is it motor control, or is it a little of all of those? So my exam has to help me get to that. So let's take care of our palpations first. So here's our patient. Uh, we'll palpate the anterior structures as we mentioned. So we begin on the coracoid process and then go diagonal across the pathway of the pectoralis minor. And then we'll bring the arm to about 45 degrees of abduction and palpate across the short head of the biceps. Then we will check the integrity of the AC joint, looking for anterior, posterior translation or laxity. And then finally, as we mentioned, the medial border palpation. So we wanna palpate over the attachment of the rhomboid muscles and a little bit of where the lower trapezius is as well. And now in this particular case with this actual patient, none of those areas are tender to palpation. So that's good. So now we're gonna take the next step. So let's do our corrective maneuvers. So we asked this patient to elevate her arm on her own and she has a good range of motion, but it's not all the way up and it hurts a little bit. So when I assist the scapula upward, she increases her motion and it's easier for her to do. So this is that scapular assistance test and we have a positive finding. 
Here's our scapular retraction test, and you can see her serratus will not work very well and keep the, the scapula against the thorax during resistance. So when we manually resist the scapula and hold it in place, we have a drastic increase in strength. So we have improvement with scapular retraction, indicating that it's positive. And then finally, this is what we call the low row test. We put the arm in slight extension and tried to, to break it in a forward position. And then once you demonstrate that there is some weakness, you tell the individual to actually contract their hip muscles as well as their core and then retest. And as you saw there towards the end, she had increased strength with core activation. Well, now we're starting to think, okay, yes, we do have a scapular problem. Um, but why do we see what we see? We have to think critically. So with our altered scapular position, especially on the right side where it's angulated, we have to think back to what Dr. Fierro taught us with the anatomy review in regards to which um, muscles, and, or excuse me, which muscles are involved and what are their functions. And so it's possible because of, of this angulated positioning, we could have just about all of the major scapular muscles uh, be dysfunctional in some way. Whether it's an activation sequencing issue or a strength issue or both, we have yet to get to that, but this is right now where we're thinking globally. Very similar in regards to the medial border position. So on the left side with this patient, it's very pronounced, suggesting that the serratus anterior and maybe even the middle trapezius are not doing their job. We don't even see a medial border on the right because it's so angulated. So that not only could that be a possible muscle dysfunction problem in the back, that could also be anteriorly some tightness of muscles pulling everything forward, not allowing the medial border to be seen. And then we also have the inferior angle of both sides being pronounced, which is likely the serratus anterior posterior, or excuse me, inferior attachment, as well as the lower trapezius and their inability to right now do full posterior tilt like we need them to. But again, we could also on the right side because of positioning still have some anterior tightness. So let's confirm our idea that this is really a muscle problem. So let's look at some clinical muscle tests that you can apply without really much effort. So the first one we're going to do is we're going to assess the serratus anterior since we believe this is part of the, the issue. To do this muscle test, we simply elevate the arm to 130 degrees, and then we instruct the patient to resist us. And you can see, not only can we break her very easy, but the scapula came right off the thorax and it couldn't hold position. We're also going to look at the middle and lower trapezius muscles. The testing for these muscles, unfortunately, are not specific for one muscle versus the other. So you're actually testing them both at the same time. And so it's the same concept. They have to be able to hold the arm position, but the key part that you know that this is actually scapular muscle weakness is if the scapula comes off the thorax and you see medial border or even inferior angle prominence. So when we do this with her, she cannot hold the position, but the scapula actually was okay. Yes, it rounded around the thorax, but you gotta remember that the, the rib cage is ellipsoid. So that rounded design is going to allow the scapula to move very visibly the way that we just saw there. So let me show it again so you can see. So you see how the scapula just moves around? That's a normal occurrence. If the medial border and inferior angle came off, I would be more concerned that those muscles were not doing their job. And keep in mind too, that this testing position being prone is very challenging even for the healthiest of people. So don't think that the arm not being able to be held in that position is a bad uh, entity necessarily. And then finally, we wanna look at the rhomboids. Uh, the rhomboids are actually best tested with the arm in neutral to even a little bit of slight extension. And again, you're looking to see if the scapula stays flush to the thorax. In this case, and I'll play it again so you can see, her scapula actually does not move hardly at all. So that indicates the rhomboids are actually probably strong enough to do their job in regards to all of these muscles we're trying to figure out. And then finally, if you remember, I mentioned, don't forget the kinetic chain. And that's, this is a key piece because there are numerous literature examples as well as a, a, a experience and anecdotal examples of where hip weakness or uh, a lack of dynamic stability in the legs or trunk can actually associate very well with arm injury as well as arm pain. And so the two ways to do that is what we call this, uh, the, the whole um, sequence is called the single leg stability series, which is actually just two maneuvers. 
The first one is the classic Trendelenburg. And you can see here, she immediately drops her hip when she elevates her leg. And this happens on both sides, indicating the gluteus medius is uh, weak in some way. And then the single leg squat, where you can see she could not control that very well on descent. And even on the other side, she goes into a little bit of valgus positioning with her knee. So that tells us that there is not control of the system as well as it could be. So let's summarize everything I just pointed out to you. We found altered scapular positioning globally. So we, we're thinking this is muscle weakness, motor control, maybe uh, a little bit of both. But we're not really finding signs of tightness. So that's not part of our, our, our concern right now. Two of our corrective maneuvers, the scapular assistance test and scapular retraction test were both positive. The assistance test, you remember, she can move better with assistance and well as with less pain. And the scapular retraction test showed us that if we stabilize the scapula, the arm as a whole and its force output increases. And so that was confirmed that this is a muscle issue when we showed that that serratus anterior muscle test that it was clearly the muscle or that particular muscle not doing its job. Uh, we also saw some dysfunction with the low row as well as the kinetic chain test, which tells us that if the hips, uh, the trunk and the legs were a little stronger and working better together, then we would probably have less dysfunction at the shoulder. And that makes sense if you think about it, this is a runner. So if she runs and has hip weakness and her hips are moving side to side during running, it's also going to alter her trunk position, which means her scapula and her arm are probably down when it's not supposed to be and creating points of friction and contact uh, in the glenohumeral joint that's not supposed to happen. So that makes sense. So overall, what do we have? We have scapular dysfunction due to serratus anterior weakness primarily maybe a little secondary weakness of the other muscles, but it was a little hard to distinguish with our testing. And we believe we do have a motor control problem because of the disconnect between the core and the scapular muscles, as well as between the scapula and the humerus. So now what do we do about this? So there are six key areas that we have publicized and have written about extensively over the years uh, about the sequencing and ordering of what you should address and how non-operatively. Um, so from, a po uh, excuse me, posture and motion, we want to make sure that scapular motion is actually being driven by the larger muscles of the trunk and the legs. We want to make sure we're focusing more on positions of scapular retraction rather than protraction. And we want to utilize closed chain exercise because of the, the safeness of it, the less shear forces we get from it, as well as the fact that it creates a lot of feedback because of the joint contact and the, and the contact we have with other surfaces. And then finally, working in multiple planes, we can't work only in one plane because the body doesn't do that. So we're actually uh, putting our patients in a position of disservice if we don't train them for what they encounter in everyday life. So in this particular case, what are we going to do? Well, we don't have to worry about her posture and mobility because she's actually good there. So we're not even gonna worry about that. Strength, however, we know we have a, a serratus issue, but there could be other factors or there could be other muscles involved. So we're not gonna only focus on just the serratus, we're gonna try to make everything work together. And of course, we also have motor control that we need to bring into this equation in order to get her system up and running as optimally as we can. So just a quick point, if you do have patients where you need to address mobility, you should do that first, but keep in mind that because structures, especially the anterior structures, have a tendency to become tight and painful, you can do interventions to make the pain be reduced or eliminated, as well as the tightness. However, it's rare that that intervention alone will make the scapula move better by itself. So this is usually a supplemental treatment that has to be done with other interventions such as strength and motor control, endurance and so on. But at the same time, um, this is not something you should ignore. So it is an important piece, but it's not the only piece is what I'm saying. Strength on the other hand, there, is, there are some tips I wanna give you. We recommend using uh, more of what we call a kinetic chain focus, which means you're going to you put the arm in short lever positions where it's closer to the body to decrease the tension and the stress on the joint. 
And you want to, as much as you can, have the person standing using their legs and their trunk to facilitate that scapula moving more fluidly. A lot of the times with the shoulder rehabilitation programs, you see people being placed on their on, in a prone position or supine, and those are very demanding, very challenging exercises. And so the, the good news is these exercises that I'm talking about now, are they're, they're good exercises. They will get people stronger. But when you have somebody with pain and dysfunction early on, because of their uh, excessive challenge to the body, they may make the patient more sore and you may not see the outcomes you wanna see. So we reserve the longer lever exercises for much later in rehabilitation, but we still don't put them on their stomachs or on their backs as often as you would think. And the reason why is if, when you really look at the literature of where those exercises came from, they all come from ex, uh, studies that utilized healthy individuals. So we don't really know the impact of these exercises on people with pain or injury as well as we should. So the, the progression we typically utilize is this. We address hip and core deficits first and early. We also, if, the, if it exists, any mobility issues at both the upper extremity as well as the lower extremity. But as in our case, we don't really have the mobility issue, but we do some have some hip and core. We then transition into the short lever kinetic chain exercises with the arm close to the body. We eventually start to bring in longer lever maneuvers, but we want to not just have the arm move by itself. We want the arm to move with the trunk or with the legs. And then finally, we will start to increase muscle endurance with the longer lever exercises by utilizing high repetition, low load type of dosing and parameters. So let me show you a sample. This is a maneuver we call the low row, so that you can see the arm is real close to the body. We're getting scapular retraction like we talked about, but it's the legs and the trunk that are facilitating the motion. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next maneuver that you're going to see is what we call the robbery exercise. And so what the instruction to the patient is to bend the knees and try to take the, the olecranons or the tips of the elbows and put them in their back pockets. That helps retraction and depression occur. This is what we call the lawnmower. So now the arm's getting a little further away from the body, but still not a full long lever. And we're using trunk rotation to facilitate scapular retraction. This is an example of classic glenohumeral external rotation, but we made it kinetic chain based by having the patient move her legs to step out and rotate her trunk to help facilitate proper arm movement. And then we make the lever longer by now doing this in flexion or scaption, but still doing the trunk rotation and stepping so the legs are driving what the arm does. And then finally, we'll wrap up with more of a challenging exercise where by using a step or an elevated surface, you challenge the hips, but it's also forcing the hips and the arm to work in sync the way the body was designed to do. So I've mentioned using the arm with trunk rotation. Um, this actually is some evidence that came just out a few years ago from Japan where they showed us that by simply taking the classic long lever exercises and utilizing trunk rotation with a synchronous arm movement, you not only increase scapular external rotation and posterior tilt, but you turn on the lower trapezius to much higher levels. So by simply integrating other body segments, in particular the core, you end up getting better rehabilitation results because of the design of the kinetic chain. But keep in mind, I've mentioned mobility, I've mentioned strength. What about motor control? Because I have alluded to that a number of times. Well, the truth is, is that we tend to focus on flexibility and strength because that's easy. That's what it's easy to identify and it's easy to think that it's part of the problem. The more complex issue is the motor control piece. And we honestly believe that a lot of the scapular dysfunction we see is a little bit of flexibility and strength, but it's probably more primarily a muscle activation slash motor control concern. And why is that? Well, unlike other parts of the body, you cannot see the scapula. And so because you can't see it, we just took away the strongest piece of feedback that we get for our neuromuscular system, which is our vision. 
So because of that, it's very difficult for a patient to understand what is quote normal motion versus not normal motion. So we put that all together, what, where should you begin? Well, there's a concept which is very basic. It's called conscious correction, which is simply instructing the patient to pull the scapulas together in a set position before they move their arm. And in rehabilitation, that's a very easy way to start because you don't have to move the, the, uh, the humerus to do this. And it's focusing on getting uh, retracted positioning in a much better way. To make conscious correction even better, you can actually provide feedback, both verbal, visual, which is great. So you can tell the patient to alter or correct the positioning of the scapula as they pull them together, but you can also have them see it for themselves. In fact, if you have a patient that you say, okay, go ahead and set your scapulas or correct them, and it looks like this where you have the right side elevated and the left side depressed, but the patient thinks this is correct allow them to look at it using a device. So using the selfie modes that you have on technology or even a mirror is a great way for the patient to see exactly where their shoulder positioning is and conscious correction then can be performed much more accurately. The final point I wanna make is as I uh, mentioned, we prefer to do our exercises standing rather than being in prone or supine positioning. And the reason why is that when they're standing, it, it completely illustrates how the kinetic chain can work when it's working properly. The other reason is, and this comes from recent biomechanical studies, that has shown us that you have more joint position sense errors when you put patients on their backs and tell them to put their arm in space. So for years, we have inadvertently been creating faulty motor patterns and didn't realize it. So therefore, it is highly encouraged to have your patients standing, but if you have a patient population that has poor balance and it's not safe for them to stand, then they should be doing their exercises sitting, but we should try to avoid supine and prone positions unless it's absolutely imperative for that patient to perform that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shasha. A couple of points from a orthopedic surgeon standpoint, uh, Aaron and I have worked together for many, many, many years. He's a great therapist and a, and a trainer and everything like that. Uh, the orthopedic standpoint, all that stuff he's talking about is very, very important. The only thing I would add to that is make sure you do a good glenohumeral joint exam because now in this individual with a run, who's a runner, you know, they're probably not going to have much trouble with their shoulder joint, but that exact posture and position can be seen in patients who do have uh glenohumeral instability and labral injuries. And you have to check that out because we may have to fix that as well. Now for all you orthopedic surgeons, you can see what a fantastic job of therapy can do. You say, well, what's, what am I supposed to do? And what you're supposed to do as an orthopedic surgeon is not necessarily to do the exercises, but to provide the right input to the therapist, which means that you need to know if the core is involved. You, very simply in your exam, you can do that single leg stability, so you can do that very easily. You can look at the scapula. If that inferior medial border is sticking out, by definition, the serratus is not working. Now, does that mean because the pectoralis is tight? Well, you can palpate that. You can tell the therapist, work on the anterior mobility, work on the scapular retraction, and tell them that you want to start with the short lever arm core stability first. You can tell them that, not that you're doing exercises, but you have uncovered this in your exam. So it's both for your benefit, thus you know what's going on, but also for the patient and the therapist benefit to know where to start. Because if you start them with the traditional open chain long lever arm exercises, they will fail. And you say, well, therapy has failed. No, bad therapy has failed, but you have not shown what the good therapy is. And so they'll get, I get this all the time. These patients come in, have you done, and they've had six months to a year of problems. I said, have you done therapy? Oh yeah, I've done therapy and didn't work at all because they did the wrong therapy. And when I say, we're gonna show you some exercises to do, I've already done them all. And so what I do is I put a $5 bill down on the table and I say, this is gonna, we're gonna show you these exercises. If you've done a single one of these exercises in your previous therapy, then that $5 bill is yours. 
So far, I've, it's still in my wallet. So the idea is that you need to do the right exercises for the right reasons based on the right exam. So your job, even though you say, well, I'm all going to do is operate. No, your job is to take care of that patient with shoulder pain. And some of those components, as I showed you, are going to be present. Doesn't mean you're always going to get them better with therapy. No, you're not. Uh, but those, even if you do have to operate on them for instability or for rotator cuff problems or something like that, they're still going to have to do that rehabilitation because it's still, it, it, your surgery is not going to correct it. I showed you that with that arthritis patient. You fix every bit of their pain, increase their motion, did not increase their function because their scapula was still not working well. So do the right part of your job as well as then letting the therapist do their job as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Keebler, for those uh, tips that is really helpful for us in, the, in our clinic. I, I have a question for, for both of you. If you have a patient with uh, supraspinatus tears and with a scapular dyskinesis, you send the patient to the physical therapy and, and he, he, he does the therapy you know, well. I mean, he improved, but not perfect the scapula. He, he, came, he comes to you with an improve in his scapular dyskinesis, but he's still with a, with a tip in the inferior part of the scapula. And he say, hey, I feel better but right now my pain is here in the supraspinatus there, but, and you feel, okay, the scapula is not perfect. It's better, but it's not pe perfect. What, what do you do? You send back to the physical therapy or you say, okay, you improve enough and go to, to fix the therapy. Yeah, so what you have done, you've probably done the best you could do with the muscles given the altered anatomy. And therefore, but you at least have started so that if you have to do the surgery, then they're way ahead of the, the game of getting the scapula back. A very interesting study came out just recently and showed that a positive, that you can use the scapular retraction test as one of the indications for surgery with a rotator cuff injury. If they have pain and soreness of rotator cuff nature and origin, and they hurt when you do this, if they are improved by scapular retraction, then that's probably a smaller tear. If they are not improved by scapular retraction, that's a larger tear and probably will need to have surgery. But if they have all the clinical findings and the MRI findings of a, of a rotator cuff tear, and you have put them on a really good scapular control program, and they've got a lot better, they're still a little tip, they still have pain, they still have weakness, then that's probably about as good as you're going to get them. You have to say, okay, now, can you live with this amount of function and soreness? If you can't, then let's fix you and get right back on the exercises. But the last, um, uh, in my clinical experience of 43 years, the serratus is the first muscle to go bad in the scapula and the last muscle to get better. And it takes almost everything working well for the serratus to really totally work well. You've got to understand this idea of conscious control that you may try to, for example, you may try to pull the scapula back, but if your serratus is not working and they don't know how to do that, they'll get their arms back, but they'll tilt. So you've got to really work hard and make sure that you really have worked as much as you can on getting that serratus under control. And uh, because there's a very good study actually from 1977 that showed that nothing, the serratus is required to make the scapula be in the retracted position to allow that normal scapular humor rhythm. And once again, the worst case scenario of having that long thoracic nerve out and the only muscle in the body is not working is the serratus, and yet you cannot use your arm above shoulder level. So it's a very important clue. We're doing some um, work with a motion capture device, and it's showing that if you start with, your, with a little bit of tilt, so the serratus is not working well, as you move your arm, everything is compensatory from there on out. If you do not have scapular control, as you start to elevate your arm, you're not going to get normal scapular control anywhere else. Now, you may be able to function and compensate and get by, but if you don't start with the scapula in retraction, it's never going to be as stable as it should in any type of motion, so that you always have a little bit of compromise of your capability of using your arm. So the serratus is, in my mind, I think in Aaron's mind, the most important structure to work on controlling the scapula um, before you talk about surgery, and even after surgery, you need to control that as well. Is that right, Aaron? 
Yes, I, I, I agree with all of that. And, and the, the other thing that, to think about is, and, and Dr. Fierro did a very good job of pointing this out. The serratus is such a massive muscle with, with many different fibrous orientations that that is why it does so much for us. But it's also very challenging to, uh, from a, at least a rehab standpoint, to try to just get that muscle. You can't do it. <laughs> you can't make the serratus work and be the focal point. Um, our bodies aren't designed that way. So you have to remember that as long as you have the patient do things the serratus does, upward rotation, external rotation, posterior tilt, if you can have them do exercises that, that uh, really get those scapular kinematics to occur, then you're going to make the muscle a little bit more uh, optimized, but you're going to work other muscles too, because other muscles help the serratus do those things. Yeah. So that's the beauty of it. Um, and so that's the, yes, it, it is the muscle that, that becomes the point of focus, but it's not the only one that gets better in the process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fierro, th we got one on, I got on my chat here, a, a perfect example of that. May we go ahead into the chat now? Yes, sir. Of course. Yes. And we have the, 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 the chat question is retired, retired sportsman's fifties cuff symptoms with dyskinesis, how to proceed. Okay. First of all, a little editorial comment. Uh, the term dyskinesis with an S on the end of it is the overall broader term. Dyskinesia is, if you look it up in the medical dictionary, dyskinesia is a specific problem of muscle activation, uh, uh, loss of control. So it's a, it's a subset of the larger picture. So just from a purist standpoint, I like to use dyskinesis. But anyway, so in this particular situation, I assume that this sportsman still likes to be active, so he still wants to do something. He's not playing maybe competitively, but he still likes to, to swim or run or do whatever he wants to do. So if he has rotator cuff symptoms, uh, we will go through the exam as we mentioned. We're going to look at the core. We're going to look at the scapula, look at the strength around the – look at shoulder rotation. Remember that a lot of these patients will have stiffness of their uh, uh, motion, which will alter the scapular position as well. So we will really get a comprehensive uh, snapshot of their deficits, of this person's deficits. Almost always, they're going to have some degree of uh, hip weakness, scapular loss of control, uh, and then the impingement symptoms. So we will, and if they have, as Aaron mentioned, if they will start with the hip and core first, we will keep their arm down. So I don't want to do anything with their arm up here because that's where it hurts. We want to start with hip and core, scapular attraction. You may need to do a subacromial injection if there's a whole lot of pain. What that does is helps you a little bit with the diagnosis, but mainly what it does is gets rid of some of that pain, which is a feedback inhibition to the scapular muscles. It seems like if you, just like if you have a painful knee, the quad shuts down. If you have a painful shoulder, the serratus and low trap shut down. So you got to get rid of whatever pain you can to allow uh, this more normalization. Uh, you do not do rotator cuff exercises uh, at this point in time. So then, and you're going to give this four to six weeks. It appears that it takes about, on, on that study I showed you, it takes about six weeks to get whatever motor control you're going to get to work, then have them come back and see you. And uh, whether you, even if you have an imaging of a rotator cuff tear, once again, this study that I quoted Every single one of them had rotator cuff tears on MRI. So it's not the presence or absence of rotator cuff injury on MRI that's going to drive the treatment. It's the capability of controlling their arm, decreasing their symptoms, and allowing them to function up here. If you can get that with hip and core scapular control so that you get the acromion out of the way, so that you get the loss of impingement, you have improved strength, then that's fine. Remember, you can still work on those force couples of the supra of the infraspinatus and the subscapularis and the deltoid to allow this motion with less impingement and less strain. So give it six weeks. If you're not better, then it's time to have that other discussion. If they're improved uh, in their scapula and their core and they feel better, as Dr. Fierro was mentioning, then have the conversation. Is this enough? If not, then are you going to need a little bit more to fix that rotator cuff? Then work on the exactly the same exercises that you're doing before. Remember, the last thing you want to do uh, to uh, affect the repair is to do a lot of open chain exercises. So short lever arm, closed chain exercises in the early rehabilitation as well. 
hopefully that gave and Dr. Hayes, is that good? Thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Nagaraj, sir, you uh, have a question. I'm sorry, what? Uh, Dr. Nagra, you have a question? Yeah, so uh, great presentation by this, this team, which we all know now, and uh, we have all learned from you. And uh, each part of what has been mentioned from the surgeon perspective, from the rehab perspective, and the anatomical perspective, we've tried to implement in our practices. Uh, a quick uh, uh, questions from the uh, rehab perspective first. Because many a times we are still training our rehab uh, teams. They are not well trained. So these guidelines have to be given by us, even though we are not so good in examination uh, part of it. So I totally agree with Dr. Aaron that uh, we have started doing detailed examinations. And uh, one of the things that comes to uh, mind is that when you talk about a, a scapula that is jutting out, which is being pulled up, you are examining from behind. You are seeing that the levators are tight. You're seeing that the lower trapezius is tight. And obviously the serratus is the main muscle, which is weak. Now we are insisting to our rehab specialist to release these tight muscles uh, and to work on the posture and the serratus anterior in the first phase. We are following all of this. My question to you is, when we work on the releases of the muscle, which according to you is the main tight muscle? Is it the levator or is it the trapezius? It's a, that's a fantastic question. And here's, here's the, the very difficult, complex answer. <laughs> uh, because we are often um, assessing tightness and inflexibility based on what we see and what we feel, and the fact that we don't get advanced imaging, we're really kind of guessing what we think it is. I would say from a palpation standpoint, uh, the, when the levator is tight, it's very easy to find. When it's the trapezius, it's difficult because of so many underlying muscles with it. So yes, the you can feel spasm, you can feel muscle contraction over the trapezius area, but is that actually the upper trapezius or is that more of maybe it's the supraspinatus to go with it? You know, it's difficult to really discern. So unfortunately, the answer is we address it all without being very specific. Um, now, could you take that a step further and based on head position and assume that if I do have upper trapezius tightness, then I would see the head be in a more extended position or maybe a little more further back, possibly. Um, sometimes when you see the, the alteration of, of height in, the, in one shoulder where a shoulder is up versus down. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that. That's probably a, a little more on the trapezius. But at the same time, we never know 100% for sure. So we actually, as part of the mobility uh, interventions, we try to do it all because we're not 100% sure. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. The, the other thing to remember is that I, I personally think that the levator is too small a muscle to do as much damage. I think it's the trap. But the, uh, and the reason I say the, the, the upper trap is because it has this very broad you know, and, uh, capability of working. And don't forget that a lot of times a muscle will appear to be tight when it actually it's, it's weak and it's actually spasming because it's stretched beyond its normal. And so all the gamma fibers are firing off and everything. And a lot of these patients, as Aaron mentioned, they, you, they appear to be tight, but they're drooped, <laughs> which means just the opposite. Sometimes they'll be kind of up this way, but if you really look at them, they're kind of protracted and everything. So I, there's, there's a, an element of length on this. So as you work on these mobility, and we do, we, we do the dry needling, we do the massage, we do the stretching. We also do strengthening because there is a tight muscle is not always strong. A tight muscle can be weak as well. And the reason that that muscle is very interesting, if you look at the trap, even though it's supposed to be one muscle, it's at least two muscles in terms of activation. We do know that if the low trap is not activating well, the upper trap is usually activating too much, spasmy or tight. And I'm pretty sure that's because if you really look at what the scapula does, and you talk about, well, the upper trap actually elevates the arm, I mean, it elevates the acromion. Well, it may not do that. It may be that as you move your arm, the low trap's not working well, so they, the, the whole thing tilts, 
which means now this upper trap is being stretched because as your arm raise, the whole thing tilts. And so what you'd have to do, in addition to whatever you're gonna do with the upper trap, you've got to get the low trap activating or else you're still gonna have that imbalance between those two muscles. And I've even gone so far as sometimes to actually Botox the upper trap because it's so spasmy. And so that's the end of my uh, treatment of this spasm is actually doing some Botox on there. But you cannot ever get the upper trap to work well if you don't have the low trap working well in its job is, uh, is what I've found in my clinical experience. Aaron, is that right? It, that's correct. And, and that's the, I think that's why the, the length of time that we've alluded to four to six weeks. And to be honest with you, sometimes it's longer than that. It takes a long time to get all of that pliable again, you know, because there are so many muscles that are part of this problem. You know, and I, I can't speak for how um, your, your patient time frames are, for, you know, in India um, or elsewhere. I, you know, for us, most patients have a maximum of one hour with a clinician and to be able to spend just 30 minutes working on mobility that doesn't often happen. Usually we end up, you know, quickly doing it uh, where we, where, where we can with ourselves, with our hands. And then it becomes a home program that we hope the patient works on their own flexibility and it doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> so compliance becomes part of the problem. Aaron, and um, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, Dr. Nishit, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, fantastic, fantastic lectures. It's something very, very eye opener. Our problem is our 60, 70 percent patients, they do not have any access to physiotherapists. And the physiotherapists, I should not say anything about it, but they are very inexperienced in shoulders. So now a patient, I have, the, I have diagnosed as a dyskinesia. Okay. So tell me that what, see, I cannot give a, a, paper, a patient a 15, 20 exercise because they're not going to remember it. So if I to give, a, shall I say, a five, six, or seven exercises for their, for their basic things, what exercises you will suggest them for scapular dyskinesia for four weeks, six weeks? So once, you, once you teach them, they do it very diligently. But you have to yes. you have to show them properly, and and you have to you will see that they have done it, uh, they have learned it properly. And that is what our main problem is that our seventy percent patients do not have access to a, a physiotherapist. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, that's a that's very right. true. No, that, that, that's exactly true, and that's one of the major problems. And so, what we have tried to do uh is is a, address this in a two or three ways the the first is you're right you can't give them 15 exercises you give them four or five to do the first three weeks or four weeks and then another four we use a lot of visual uh we use um either sheets of exercises illustrated on pieces of paper we have produced videos that will um you know some people have that and then we Put all these exercises on a on a website so that they have, if they can access access through the through the internet they will have those as well. But you're exactly exactly right. You have to kind of do it in a progression. So once again, what we do in ours is we will give them on the day they leave. We'll say, okay, the first three or four weeks we want you to do core stability. We want you to do what we call the elbows and the back pockets, where we keep your arms down through here. We will do very simple exercises. Uh, and we have the names like the robbery or the lawnmower so that they understand what we're talking about. And then we will, we'll, uh, for example, in a, a program that we have uh, for this post uh, after surgery for this scapular muscle detachment, they're from all over the world. And so we have developed a, a set of exercises that they can take home and there'll be four or five the first four weeks and then four or five the next several weeks like that so and and how you do that once again we have protocols aaron's developed a lot of protocols that you can do that way but you're exactly right whatever way that you can of giving it to them when they leave whether it's sheets of paper with instructions to this exercise this exercise maybe if you can actually make sure they can demonstrate they can do them because this is tough 
to try to do these exercises that in places they can't see it. They'll, they'll do this, but they'll do it the wrong way. So you guys hopefully make sure that they can do it the right way. And then and how, if you, how do you monitor that? How do you monitor that? Well, a couple of ways. One is have them come back in six weeks to the office. If not, nowadays with the COVID and everything, we're doing a whole lot of telemedicine where we're, we're you know, connecting by the internet and having them turn around and show me to do the exercises and they can, they can show us whether they're doing the exercises correctly. So I think- uh, I would like to say, uh, and what, to highlight what Dr. Kibler said, I have found more success when I have a patient in front of me that I'm gonna send home with exercises where I take my iPad and I record them doing the exercises I want them to do so they know how it feels and what it should look like. When I give them pre-made footage, they don't really understand what they're watching. And so when they have had a chance to do it themselves and I get to video record them, then it, 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 there's a lot better connection mentally and there's better context when they take them home. And I know that takes a little bit of time and it probably makes your day a little longer, but it's, it worked very well, at least in, in the university setting that I've been working in as of late. I so think the question, what's, what's the website? The website for our place is www.shouldercenterofky, all one word, shouldercenterofky.com. So uh, just taking that discussion forward, I think uh, one of the things that I have realized in my practices is that it's very difficult for the patients to just be shown some pictures to actually replicate the exercises. They can be counterproductive. When I started with understanding the scapular pathology, simple thing like scaption, most of the rehab specialists in India, they give elevation and retraction in one go. And we know very well that the tight muscles have to be countered. So it's actually counterproductive. So uh, that message has to be very clear to the audience that it's, it's, it's difficult for the patients. And the second part, which Dr. Aaron mentioned about the biofeedback, whenever it's a front pathology, we ask our patients to stand in front of a mirror and kind of symmetric, symmetrically create the movement on the other side. And it was wonderful, the idea that you showed of using your iPad to give them the biofeedback. And like Dr. Nishit mentioned, this can be something that can be really helpful, wherein you can actually see the video of your patient from front and from behind for the, for the biofeedback. A question. The best, the, the, the best um, verbal feedback I give the patient is I tell them that every exercise they do should end up with their elbows in the back pockets. See that, and you, everybody knows what th what this is. I mean, you, so you got to put your elbow in your back pocket, and it has to be symmetrical. You got to put both elbows the same spot right there. So whether you're doing the low row, whether you're doing the robbery, whether you're doing any type of exercises, pull downs, that you always end up with the elbow in your back pocket, and that people can kind of understand that. That's my best visual. The other thing I do in in the office is that was not mentioned is tactile. I will when they don't understand what's going on back there. I say, okay, do this. And they say, well, okay, I did it. I said, no, I want you to feel it right here. And I push right on the inferior medial border of the scapula. So they now, even though they don't know it, they, they can feel me. And sometimes I'll have their, their, whoever's in there, their family member or something like that say, oh, I want you to, I want you to poke right there. And we tried to come up with a, like a ball or something you could stick back there. And that doesn't work very well. But if you can do some kind of tactile, feedback to them as well is another helpful um, adjunct. So I'd like to quickly ask something from the shoulder surgeon perspective to Dr. Kibler and his team. Now imagine you have an AC joint dislocation, Rockwood type 5. It's a young active individual. Now we have literature which says that even in military recruits, if you do the rehab at six months down the line, if you do a chronic AC joint reconstruction, then the results at the end of a year are as good as what you do in the acute stage. This has come out from the John Turkish and the military population group. At the other end, we have new techniques coming up for the superior inferior stabilization, anterior posterior stabilization in the form of the dog bone reconstruction with internal brace. And the key factor in them is to make sure you operate in the first two weeks because the conoid trapezoid and the AC joint ligaments have the chance to heal. So now if I have a patient who's young, who's got a Rockwood type 5, both the literature is in front of me where I put him on rehab, the scapular rehab, and ask him to come back to me after some time, vis-a-vis -vis losing the chance to have an acute repair. So with Dr. Kibler, with your immense experience, if you could guide us for this patient population, what would yes. be your advice? Exactly right. Well, I, I've, I have that experience. We actually have written up 
this in our in the journal of arthroscopy so my okay first of all you got to go to the concept of what is a, a pathological anatomy the pathological anatomy is that you've torn the both conoid and trapezoid and all of the ac ligaments and therefore you have lost the suspension of the scapula to the clavicle but you also lost the connection of the scapula to the clavicle which as the scapula moves the clavicle moves which makes the arm move you also have lost every bit of the stability of the ac joint so therefore if you're going to fix this best way you can restore the best anatomy you need to address all of those structures so uh, first of all I, I look at the patient and they'll come in say you know two or three days after their injury I will look if they have the scapular dyskinesis showing that you've lost the strut of the of the uh, clavicle then I tell them that there is a you, you got this problem and you may have this problem later on I will give everybody two to three weeks because at two to three weeks they will get rid of a lot of their acute pain. And if they're still uh, in dyskinesis position, I stabilize them in, sca in scapular attraction. And sometimes about two thirds of the time, you can actually reduce the, the AC joint fairly well and have them move their arm. In that situation, if they say, well, this is something I need to have, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm going to use the arm overhead, I'm gonna do some running, then the anticipated results of not having the best position are not going to be good. Now, indeed, the operation I do, I do the exact same operation at three weeks, three months, six months, the exact same operation. And the, and the, what I do is I do not use that kind of dog bone or any kind of stuff. I use biology. It's written up. Uh, it's, we we writ, wrote this up uh, in the Journal of Arthroscopy. I do a um, open procedure. I use a semi- Tendon, a semitendinosus allograft. Uh, I make two anatomic drill holes exactly where the conoid and trapezoid belong to attachment on the clavicle. You can find that. The trouble with the dog bone is you do, it's not anatomic. It's not an anatomic position but, uh, because there's two of these and they're staggered. They're not one. It's not in the middle. They're staggered. The conoid is almost vertical to posterior on the clav clavicle. The trapezoid is 30 degrees this way and a fairly linear um, uh, attachment on the clavicle over a, a distance. So you got these two th two things you have to reproduce anatomically. I, I, I make my drill holes exactly anatomically through the clavicle, wrap uh, past this around under the under the coracoid, bring it back up. I reduce the AC joint. Remember the AC joint is, is the key. The AC ligaments in an AC separation are avulsed off of the clavicle in a in a in a wad or in a, in a group you can actually find these ligaments you have to sometimes fish them out in an acute situation they're right there you can fix them in the chronics they're stuck either on the bottom of the clavicle or on the edges of the clavicle you take them off of the clavicle mobilize them get all of the uh, material out of the, out of the joint, which in a chronic one is scar tissue and thickened tissue. In an acute one, you can just reduce it. You reduce that joint and you can find that you can actually bring the AC ligaments back to where they're supposed to be. So the <laughs> reconstruction is, as you pass these around, reduce the joint, stable, I use five pieces of number one PDS as my internal brace. And so I pass that with the graft, you tie them and suture them in the reduced position, creating the CC ligament reconstruction, bring the tails over to the uh, acromion and actually dock them in to the acromion using transacromial drill holes. And once again, the, the procedure is uh, in, the, in the literature. And then you use anchors to bring the AC joint back to where the AC ligaments back to where it's supposed to go. So I prefer an early reconstruction because it's technically easier, but I do the same operation. And my results, we have now 45 of these, and our results are no loss of reduction and a good function, good scapular control with that procedure where they do it acutely or chronically. But the key point is that know which ones you need to operate on 
and because the literature is is varied, but none of not a single one of those literature has ever looked at the scapular position as an indication of surgery or as a functional outcome of the surgery. All the other procedures where you use the single dog bones or even double dog bones, if you don't fix the AC joints, that's a problem. If you don't fix the ligaments anatomically, then you don't recreate the normal biomechanics. Because remember, not only is this a suspension between the clavicle and the scapula, but these are torque transducers so that as you move the scapula, it actually transfers the torque and moves the clavicle into this position of posterior rotation, which is what you need for overhead positioning. Uh, and you lose that if you don't fix. Now, can the ligaments, you know, the idea behind this early reconstruction is will these torn ligaments reattach if you put the two edges together? Well, maybe, but once again, you don't like that. I mean, that's not the best situation. So I, I would not uh, take the chance of, well, maybe those ligaments will heal, maybe they won't. If I put that dog bone in there and put those two edges together, the reason why those fail, why the clavicles fracture, why the coracoids fracture, there's too much bending and torsional twist because you don't take care of the AC joint and you don't do the anatomic where you displace the load two points rather than a single point. You know, that's my, that's my answer to you. <laughs> Thank you. Pages. Anybody, any questions? Uh, no, sir, no questions. No, uh, no questions on YouTube because uh, okay. I think uh, if we have time, I'd like to ask some one, one, one very relevant question in this discussion. Is it okay or are we short of time? Oh, sure. No, 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 we have a time. Again, a uh, question to uh, Professor Kibla. Uh, my question is with regards instability shoulder associated with scapular distending. There are two entities which come to mind. Posterior instability and the so-called multi-directional instability or positional functional instability. These young girls come with active instability episodes and their scapula is all over the place. Even for the rehab specialist and for us to explain as to what you need to do with the scapula is very difficult. Uh, some of them do well with scapular positioning exercises. My question to you specifically, have you evaluated the pacemaker option, the device based on the spinous fossa, activate the infraspinatus and the posterior trunk muscles, and any guidelines for these patients with dyskinesia with functional positional instability? Oh, excellent question. Very good question. Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback from some people that. Dr. Tejal, I think you have to Anyway, so I'll take the first one. The, uh, the posterior shoulder instability uh, is a difficult problem. If, if, uh, if there's enough anatomic damage to the labrum and the ligaments, then the dyskinesis is probably secondary to the shoulder problem. So, in other words, that situation, the shoulder is driving the scapula. And you'll not get that better unless you fix the anatomy. Now, the way to determine that is do a scapular retraction, scapular assistance test. And if they improve their stability and decrease their symptoms, then rehabilitation may play a role in that uh, situation. Just like in rotator cuff, sometimes you, what you'll do, you get a little bit better, but they still have symptoms. And so in that group, I, I have you know, more often than not needed to fix the anatomy before the scapula really um, does as well as it can. So, um, but you always try that scapular retraction, scapular assistance. Now the multi-directional, these functionally, remember that's an entirely different situation. The symptoms there are in the mid ranges of motion. And if you watch, they'll elevate the arm and then the, then the scapula drops and the arm goes out of place. So, and they've done studies that show that what happens at that moment is that the supraspinatus is inhibited, the serratus is and lower trap are in, inhibited, the pectoralis minor and latissimus are overactivated. And so what you get is this drop down. And what happens is the glenoid actually opens up, it kind of the bottom drops out of the shoulder joint, and the latissimus pulls the arm out of place. So your idea is can you somehow get the get this reverse so that as you move your arm, the scapula retracts, straightus works, latissimus does not work and the joint stays stable. Now, of course, these all have these loose ligaments, but a lot of these, if you look at the ones that don't get better with therapy, they actually have tears of the labrum. 
they actually will over a period of time with this humeral head translation will actually split and tear the labrum. So there is something that needs to be fixed. It's an instability. But the large majority of these, if you, once again, if you stabilize the scapula and move their arm, you will find that they will not do that right there, which shows you how important the scapula is. Now, the key is getting that straightest to work and getting rid of that pectoralis tightness. So it takes a lot of effort because this is a learned pattern over a long period of time. It takes months. I tell them that it takes at least two to three months to get this under control. It's always kind of funny. You see this 15 year old girl and she does this and she almost kind of smiles. Oh, look what I can do. I'm, I know, everybody gets all worried about it and everything like that. So then you stabilize the scapula and you move your arm and they can't do it all of a sudden. And they're not, they're not happy. Now they took, you took your party trick away from them. But the idea, there is a group that once again, if you can use that, those corrective maneuvers, the scapula assist, scapula retraction, to kind of get the idea, if you can stabilize the scapula, do you change the function, the symptoms right there? There are a group of patients, once again, like I say, the shoulder drives the scapula sometimes. Sometimes the scapula drives the shoulder. And using these tests can kind of separate these out and then you can work on them but you still have to understand that in this MDI, it's not just the capsule that's loose in the symptomatic ones that you can't get better uh, with that, that you'll actually sometimes will see some labral tears and there'll be little splits. They won't be just rips off the way you see with these posterior instabilities. There'll be splits and this whole, and the labrum is just laying flat. There's no, there's nothing, no labral bumper at all. And so you have to reconstruct not only the ligament laxity, but if you just do that, it'll fail again because you still have not taken care of this bumper. So I actually, I, I, I free this up. I put my anchors into the bone and I take a generous uh, bite of the capsule as well as the labrum and pull all that back up. So you have a bumper there, not just tightening up the capsule, but you actually have a recreating bumper. That then allows more stability. Then you have to work on your exercises and it's going to be key. They're going to have to do the exercise because their biology will always stretch out. So if you get that scapula working well, you have a chance of dynamically stabilizing glenohumeral humeral joint. Thank you. I think uh, <clears throat> we are running out of time now. So kindly, uh, I told Dr. Nagaraj Sir and Dr. Guido Parera for uh, concluding remarks. I think Dr. Parera should do the. Thanks to you, uh, all Ortho TV team, for this invitation. It was a really honor to share this webinar with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. There was just one final thing on chat here. They asked an AC reconstruction to. Uh, reconstruct the AC ligaments during the CC? Yes. I mean, you, you'll you never get this right unless you include a good AC ligament reconstruction to stabilize that, that joint. You cannot control the AC joint by just fixing the CC ligaments. You've got to fix the AC ligaments as well. It's written up, we did it, in, I think it's 2017 in the Journal of Arthroscopy. It's called the MADOC, M-A-D-O-K procedure. So, uh... Thank you all very much. I really enjoyed it. This has been a lot of fun. Boy, I, I really get into this, as you can tell. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Kibler. Thank you, Dr. Aaron, Dr. Fierro. Uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, how, and our patients who actually are not able to thank you, but trust me, from their perspective also, all these concepts have really helped these patients so far away. Once again, thank you very much for all your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Okay. thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.